to start by saying that unfortunately Chanan couldn't make it today. He's uh, battling a cold, so I'm going to actually take over his presentation. But because I didn't prepare his presentation and I don't have the demo materials that he has, there won't be a demo of what he was going to talk about. Uh, but, I can, but I can assure you that they work because I do it every day. Um, he was going to uh, talk about importing CSV files from the command line and then sort of get, getting you guys a feel for different ways of getting data into Civi CRM. But before we start, I just wanted to ask the audience here, who here considers themselves a developer? You raise your hand. Okay. Who here has done a data migration at some point in their life, either been involved as a programmer or on staff? Or Okay. Okay, great. Who here is planning to do data migration in the next six months to a year? Okay. Who here deals with more than 500,000 records? Okay, great. Um, excellent. Um, who has used Pentaho data integration before or knows what that is or at least heard about it? Okay, one person. Great. Um, so for everyone else, there was an exciting, excellent talk done two years ago here at this CiviCon London that explains sort of the basics of Pentaho data integration, which is a tool that a lot of uh, implementers like myself and other companies are using. And um, it has a really nice introduction and it shows you how you build up a job, how to execute it, how, what, what are some of the things that you can do with it. And uh, I really recommend you guys to go to that talk and get those details. I have, them, I have a link to, on my slides to that talk. Um, I won't go too deeply into the basics because that's going to take at least half an hour. I want to kind of move on to more advanced topics. Um, but let's get started with migrating data to Civi CRM. This is a very developer-focused session. Um, but at the end, if you have anything that needs clarification along the way, make sure you let me know. I can dig in and, and dive, dive into it. Likely, if you have a question, somebody else in the audience also has the same question. So rather than jumping ahead, it's better to just clarify things and move on. Uh, great. So Chanan's talk, I'm going to... Uh, channel him right now, um, is migrating data into Civi CRM. Okay. Hopefully because that's far, it'll, it'll yeah. work for now. Let's, let's, let's pray. Okay. Great. Um, so in this talk, I'm going to go over how to import a CSV file. Uh, we all deal with CSV files as kind of the interchange format for any type of data project. Uh, and CSV stands for comma separated value. Um, those are the files that you can easily pull up on Excel or inspect using a text editor. Um, and we're going to import them from the command line and also use something known as Pentaho. And I'll go into more of the details in my talk as well. Um, so how do you import a CSV into uh, Civi CRM? There is a way of doing that in the Civi CRM UI. It's called sort of the import wizard. It has a step-by-step -step procedure of how to get from a CSV file uh, into uh, data that ends up in Civi CRM. And you can kind of de determine what the separator should be, uh, whether it should update or um, overwrite, um, and uh, things like that. And it's a pretty elaborate process. And at the end of the day, you can probably get data into it reasonably well, uh, but it's not meant to be used for 50,000 records or so. Because eventually, each web process itself has some security concerns when processes are running too long. and there are sort of built-in timeouts that will get triggered and your import will just stop. Um, yeah, so for instance, the size of the payload that you're trying to upload is too large, then PHP is going to complain and say, well, what are you trying to do? Maybe you're trying to upload a virus. We're going to stop you. There could be timeouts, m many other things. So a better way of doing that is not going through the web user interface, but actually logging on to the server itself. So um, imagine rather than, say, me, you remoting into my laptop, I can just go to my laptop and start typing, right? So that's kind of the equivalent of going to the server and doing something on the command line. Um, how do you do that? Well, um, you get onto the command line of the server by using a, a protocol called SSH, Secure Shell. Um, you SSH into the machine, then you use a PHP command line command, um, and you upload the CSV file from that position, and then uh, issue a set of commands. There's a couple ways of doing that. 
there's an API batch tool. I won't go into details on that um, that you can use for this type of import. Um, what we generally tend to use a lot is this PHP import function. It's located and it comes with every distribution of Civi CRM. If you look under the Civi CRM root, it's located under sites, all modules, and this is the Civi CRM root basically here under bin CSV, and there should be three functions there. One is import, one is export, the other one is delete. And um, with the import function, if you specify these, uh, um, uh, so here you're basically saying, I want to import a contact record, and then uh, you don't actually need to provide any of these pieces. You just need to provide at the end uh, the location of the CSV file. So you specify, I want to import. I want to import what, which is the entity, which could be a contact, a contribution, uh, anything that sort of Civi CRM deals with on the API level. You specify that and then give it a CSV file. Now, the CSV file has to be in a very specific form for this to work because if you're adding columns that it doesn't understand what to do with, then it'll just error out on you. But you know, there's certain conventions. If you're not sure what columns to include, you can also just run the export function and say php export.php hyphen and then the entity, for instance, in, you know, contact, and then it'll give you a whole list of what, what fields it's expecting, what columns it's expecting for the import. And you can kind of reverse engineer what you would put in in order to get the data to go in. Um, and it's, it's very fickle, so like if, you, if it has an underscore, you have to add it. If it's all lowercase, you have to make sure it's all lowercase, so forth. Um, that's a very common way for us to actually import large amounts of data because you're not going over the network. So I'm not uploading anything to the web UI. I'm not really going through Apache, the web server. Um, I'm issuing a command line command on the server, and then PHP just happily goes and chugs along and works row by row on the CSV file until everything is done. So then this is the demo that we're going to skip because um, I would have just issued that command and you would have seen doo -doo -doo -doo, all these things running and creating IDs. I'm not going to do that. Uh, but uh, only each entity. So you can do only one entity at a time. So I have to specify I want contact. and I might import individuals and organizations, but I can't do contacts and their street addresses and their phone numbers and their emails, which is sort of what you would consider um, being able to do using a, what's known as API chaining. I have to do an API call for the entity called the contact and then related entities like email and phone number, I also include as part of that API call. You can't do that from the CSV importer. But you can use this tool called Pentao Data Integration. It is also open source. It was developed uh, quite a while ago, and at some point it was named Kettle. And there's an etymology for why it's named Kettle. Uh, it was part of the KDE project some time ago. So it was the KDE ETL tool, and sort of acronymized as Kettle. Um, they love using kitchen analogies, so a script that takes a Kettle transformation and applies it without the user interface, it's called kitchen, and then you know the script that schedules things is called the pan, and so and spoon is the ETL tool, so there are all these kind of words that have to do with kitchen metaphors. Um, because in some sense, dealing with data is sort of like a cooking process, right? You take raw ingredients, which are the raw data, and you prepare them somehow, and then hopefully in the end you have some sort of delicious insight or dish that you can produce, or a new system that you're creating. On the bottom here, you see um, sort of a sample transformation. And I'll go into more detail what the sort of differences are. But in a transformation, you really just care about data flowing from one direction to the other. Um, unlike other programming languages that are sort of line by line, this is a visual programming interface. So it's a little more intuitive for the uh, lay user who's not a programmer. Because you can take building blocks from the left and connect them up sort of like Lego blocks and they shuffle data from in the, in the direction of the arrow. Um, not to get too deeply into this, but one of the reasons why this type of tool is very, very efficient is because it's coded up in Java, which is multi-threaded. So each one of those things is a process. And if you had, imagine, a bifurcation and you had two different things happening in two different branches of the data set, it's all running in parallel. So you're not really... And when you are scripting this, you might have to start off one arm of this, and then at some point you have to start up the second arm, but you have to worry about them synchronizing at the end. In this way, 
basically the data streams through and at some point it might merge and diverge, but it just flows like water, basically. You just build the pipes and then let the data flow through it, which is a lot more intuitive if you think about large batch processes. Uh, more intuitive than doing large batch processes, which are really hideously difficult because you have to do locking and prevent one data has to arrive first before the other one can start, and that, that's just really messy. Great. So the demo, sorry. Um, I will give you a slight demo, a smaller demo later on when we go into the more advanced topics. Um, and that would be his presentation. Any questions so far? Correct. Is there a way of getting rid of the data that comes with Civi, the default data? Is there? A yeah, so at install time, you can specify, I don't want any demo data in there, and then it will just not install it. Is there a way of clearing out Civi? Clearing up, yes. Um, you could, per, for instance, use the delete uh, CSV function and just give it a list of the ID numbers from 1 through 200, and then it would just delete all the contact records. Um, that's just a pretty easy way of doing that. Great. What's the requirements of Pentahoe? Ah, great. I will, I'll, I'll skip over this question because I'll actually answer it in my talk. Um, as a quick little interlude between the two talks, um, I want to remind everyone that there are free drinks being offered at the LAM, which is just down the road. So as we exit this venue, we're going to just make a left-hand turn and keep walking for about 13 minutes, unless somebody wants to take the detour and add four minutes by looking at the neighborhood. But I think a straight shot is a pretty good bet. Great. Okay, let's not scare people with the most complex line. Okay, here we go. Oh, I should also add that Chanan is part of the CompuCorp. They're really big sponsors of this event, and they're really instrumental in doing the logistics. So, um, you know, do give them a shout out if you if you like this conference in general. Uh, great. I am. Uh, I don't know what this is. Okay. So my part of the talk is going to talk a little bit more about best practices. It's going to, because uh, not many of you guys are familiar with Pentao, I'll go into some more detail on why Pentao is such an awesome tool. Um, and uh, I myself, I'm from Chicago, um, and um, I like attending European conferences because it gives me kind of an insight into the other side of the world where most of the people live. <laughs> and uh, it's really nice to see other ways of doing things. Uh, that are non-American. Great. So, Pentaho. Uh, Pentaho data integration is a really mature and stable platform. We started using it about five years ago, and my company is six years old. So, actually, no, we started using it seven years ago, and my company is six years old. So, um, it's been around for quite a while. It's been really stable. Um, and they recently got bought out by Hitachi. So, um, they're sort of um, making strides into getting into the big data space and uh, basically becoming the Swiss Army Knife tool for large uh, Hadoop uh, map reduced jobs. And it's, uh, it's quite exciting to see this tool blossom um, the way it has. Um, it's based on Java, so you can actually install it on any platform that runs Java. And um, you could theoretically run it on a Raspberry Pi if you wanted to. Okay. Um, for installations and sort of basics of how to uh, make transformations in jobs, I would refer you back to this talk and video, which is really good. And it's very sort of detail-oriented and, and talks a lot about sort of connection points to Civi CRM. Um, okay. So uh, if you take a note here, um, Pentaho data integration is, is the name of the tool. So data integration, so the word that um, encompasses where you have different systems that need to be talking to each other on a data level. And then Pentaho data integration is basically just sort of the glue that holds things together by using those pipes and looking up one value over here but pulling in data from another source. And so it has two pieces within it. Um, it has a job engine. A job is nothing more than just a bunch of transformations stacked together. So the smallest unit of everything is actually just this, which is called a step. And a step, you drag from the 
design menu over, and then you connect the steps, and you create a transformation. And um, I'll give you an illustration of what a transformation would do. For instance, it might download a file from an FTP server that's a text file that somebody who's canvassing uploads there on a regular basis. It downloads the CSV file. That's a step. Then it uh, opens the CSV file and looks inside to see what columns there are and then processes those columns as a stream. It might do some uh, remapping of the data. For instance, male, female might be remapped to something that CiviCRM understands, which is zeros and ones, right? So I think, uh, or one and two. I think one is female, two is male. And then uh, it might spit out sort of uh, another CSV file that now is amiable for a CiviCRM import using the same method that we just talked about with the CSV importer. So you could think of this as just a way of automating all of these little steps that you might have to do, taking an input format and creating a sort of a different output format that's more machine friendly. Um, and then when you take these transformations, you can chain the transformations in a job. So this is, this is basically, if you double clicked on this icon, you would get a whole bunch of these steps. And then you can build more complex things. So there's sort of the building block of a step, which is nested inside a transformation, which is then nested inside a job. Um, and then you can also have jobs running other jobs as well. So that, that's also possible. Um, I won't go into details here. There's um, different ways of launching the job, there's different ways of launching, the, uh, but basically the development happens all with this one program called Spoon. So when you install Pentaho and, and put it into unzip the directory and you have Java installed, everything is basically there. You want to find the spoon.bat file or spoon.sh file, double click on that and then this user interface pops up that lets you create all this magic in the, in the IDE. So it's an integrated development environment. All of these transformations, jobs uh, and transformations, get saved in a repository. And you should choose, and I'll, I'll give you some ideas on what the best choice is here, but you can choose to put it into a relational database, which would be MySQL by default, or you can have it stored as files. And uh, the content of these transformations is basically XML, because Java really likes XML, and so your transformations are XML scripts basically that outline where the step is and how it's connected to the other step and you get this sort of topology of what, what, what you're looking at. And then uh, you can either put it in a database or you can get individual files that have this extension K job, so kettle job or kettle transform KTR. Okay? So far so good? Great. Could you install that on your development server or would you install that? Before? Excellent question. I will also answer that down the road. Uh, you can install anywhere. So uh, I would recommend uh, not putting long running jobs on your, on your laptop because you know, it gets hot, you might want to sleep, <laughs> um, you want to put it to sleep, you know, so then it's good to have an instance on a cloud based server and nowadays Linode and DigitalOcean are so cheap, you don't need a lot of RAM to do this, sort of four gigabytes is plenty, so you should just rent one of those machines if you're doing a large migration and have those long running jobs run there. That's much, much easier. And I'll tell you a little bit more about how that's best done because it is very visual, so sometimes you really want to peek in there and how do you do that if you're on a Linux server, right? Great, so I'm just gonna do a quick recap of what are some of the major ways Pentaho data integration, PDI, can get data into CiviCRM. There's SQL execution, which basically means you can craft a SQL statement um, and SQL is sort of the language that databases speak. So if you want a database to actually store data or retrieve data, you have to speak its language, which is SQL. And you can craft a SQL statement that might be an insert statement, say insert into table, CiviCRM underscore contacts, yada, 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 this name, and all these other columns. And then it would insert a whole row into CiviCRM. Um, that's usually done in conjunction with the JavaScript stuff because there is there's an, a step that you can pull down that allows you to just write an arbitrary JavaScript script file, actually, and that gets executed. It's very flexible. Um, why is this not a good idea? Well, uh, SQL is just SQL. It just inserts the row, but doesn't quite know about other things that are happening. So um, the nice thing about using an API is that in the API, if uh, one step fails and it'll roll back things, um, 
the API is sort of also more cognizant about other tables that need to be updated because it, it's aware of the relationships between the entities. So uh, SQL ex execution of while it's very fast can kind of sometimes not work the way you intended because you're missing other tables that should be updated as part of the insert. Um, a better approach is going on to what Pentao Data Integration recently developed called a marketplace. It's just a drop-down menu from the interface where you can sort of see other extensions that have been written that are specific to Pentaho. And one of them happens to be written by Amnesty International, and they wrote a civic CRM input step and a civic CRM output step. What that means is you put in the credentials for the API, which are a site key, a user API key. The user API key is a little weird to generate, but there's a civic CRM extension that you can download that Civi Desk wrote. And uh, it's not compatible with 4.7, but if you just edit one line, then it won't complain and install just fine. You can create for every user that you have in Civi CRM a specific API key. And then with that API key, you can do input and output operations. So you could say, using the Civi CRM, Civi CRM API, give me all memberships um, you know, records, for instance. And then I'll just spit it out. And so that's what is being used behind the scenes. It sort of wraps around this API call. Sort of, it has all these field values you need to specify. And then when you want to pull the data out, it just streams that data out of Civi CRM and makes it available as a stream for you to do other things with it down the road. Um, you could use this to read data from Civi CRM about an entity, but you could also use it to push data into Civi CRM for a specific entity. So that's why the input output steps are different. Um, we touched on the CSV intermediary file, which is always available under the bin CSV import.php location. And that's just able to import massive amounts of data, but it, once again, it only does one entity at a time because you can really only specify one entity. Um, and the REST client step is a little more versatile because you can actually chain API calls. You can say, create a, create a contact, also create, when that contact gets created, there's an ID that gets created, right, in Civi CRM. That's a unique record ID. And the contact ID, then you can add a variable and say, well, whatever you get back from that API call, now use that as the contact ID for the phone number and for the address that I have for you. And then you can chain all these things because they're all related to the same contact. Rather than doing the contact first, then having to do a lookup, figuring out what did I import, give me the contact ID back, and then tying them together later. That's sort of the approach that most people use when they use C. That being said, the last C and D are probably the most mature ways of importing large amounts of data. Um, the Amnesty folks have not really updated B, and so I've had some issues in the past where it was either not version matching with the current version of Civi CRM or there were some errors, so use with caveat umter that Amnesty has kind of moved on and they're doing other things. They might update it, but they might not. And then the SQL execution, I would just stay away from, unless you know exactly what you're doing. Okay, here are some of the best practices that I'll walk through in terms of how to get the most bang for the buck from Pentaho data integration. Um, and then I have some other points that are just migration general uh, um, that are really useful. And so this is nothing that, these are things that you probably won't find in textbook because um, we've kind of banged our head against Pentaho long enough to know, okay, these are some big problems and these are some ways around it. So um, there's a point that I didn't mention here, like zero, I think it should be, which is find some way of organizing your transformations. Um, some people like to do it like reading from left to right. Uh, I'm more trained as a physicist, so I think gravity top down, right? So like data flows in from the top and like a river goes down into the ocean, right? So there's sort of a top down approach that I'm using and it, it helps me kind of visualize and think about where is the data coming from? Well, I just go up river, right? And I know where, it, where it's coming from. Um, other people use sort of a rat's nest approach where things are all over the place and I, I think it's really hard to keep those maintained, but find one way that suits your way of thinking about the problem and, and just stick to it. That, that's my recommendation. Um, and I'll sort of un, unwrap each one of those pieces individually as well. Um, then there's sort of data migration best practices. Um, 
there's a couple points that I didn't mention here, but I'll, I'll kind of get into it later if we have some time um, related to how you can actually manage a migration, because a lot of migrations in the past that we are aware of um, before we started using this sort of approach at Amphanos was um, other implementers might say, well, we're going to do data migration, okay, folks? So there's your live system. It's currently running. It's legacy. It's old and creaky, but we're going to move you guys to Civi CRM. So what we're going to do is have you guys stop working on your legacy system, give us a week to migrate everything, and then there will be like a week of no work <laughs> done, and then all of a sudden the new system will go online, and then, you know, you should be, you should be happy about the new system. Well, that approach... <clears throat> is rather dangerous because during that week you can't do any work or the two days that it's down. At the same time, the staff is not really used to seeing both data, data pieces in the same context or in different, different contexts, right? They know, they know what the data means, but they've never seen a contribution record in their old system like Razor's Edge and in the new system. So it becomes confusing. It's best to actually have those two systems run parallel for a while so that people are familiar with it. They can search for the same records in both systems before sort of the big switch happens. So I highly recommend running two systems side by side as you're doing the migration. Great. So uh, tip number one, instead of using the database uh, backend for the repo, pick the file-based one. Um, I think in the past, file-based ones were hard to synchronize because if two team members are working on the same ETL, um, you know, I would have to shuffle a file across, but if we all work off of a relational database that's storing all the transformations, then you and I can log on to the same database and get the same transformation. So that was sort of one of the main reasons. But nowadays, we might want to work from a coffee shop that doesn't have Wi-Fi. So well, how are you going to do that if you can't connect to the uh, MySQL database repo? And then if you download your own local copy, well, how are you going to sync it up to the master copy that the rest of the team is using? So it becomes really complicated. It becomes easier if you just use file-based. And, and there are great services like Dropbox that just take care of this hassle of synchronizing files across. So I can work on my laptop, I update, save a new transformation, I make some modifications, save it. Dropbox does all the syncing for me, and then the cloud-based instance that I'm working with eventually also has the same copy, so I don't have to think about it. Um, and some people think, well, this is code, right? Like, this is what we developed, so we should put it into Git. Uh, do not put it into Git. Because literally, by the time you move one step by a pixel, the XML will change, and then you have a diff, and you need to, you know, figure out why there's a difference. It's, it's not worth it. And since Dropbox gives you file versioning as well, uh, if you're on the business user account, it doesn't make any sense. Any questions about that? So um, it maybe sounds a little nebulous, but at some point you have to create a repository. Otherwise, it will just spit out files. And a repository is basically sort of think of it as a folder where you store transformations and jobs. And so when you start up Pentaho, you can just go and, and this is an initial dialogue that you get. You want to make some sort of connection to a repository. So you can have a repository for one type of project and another one, so forth, multiple here. Or you can just decide to add a new repository with the plus sign. And then you get the option between Pentaho repository, which is the enterprise storage. I think that only comes with the license if you pay that, which is um, something like tens of thousands of dollars per year. But you can also choose the open source community free edition. And then you can create your own database repository, which is just a MySQL store backend that you connect to to store all of your transformations and jobs. Or what I would really highly recommend, using the file repository. And then having that save everything to a Dropbox folder that then takes care of the syncing. And then you can install a Dropbox client. They're available for Mac, Linux, and Windows. So you can install that on the Linux machine on your remote VPS server. And you know, you're off. And you can continue. Question? OK, great. Um, so that's where all of your transformations will be saved. and then. Uh, another thing that some people ha have done that I've seen is they have divided repositories by client projects. I think that's a terrible idea. Part of the beauty of um, Pentaho is that you can cut and paste and draw circles around sub 
components from a transformation and just cut and paste them over, right? Big chunks of functionality. And if you have different repositories, it just becomes such a hassle because you have to disconnect the repository, connect to the other repository, open the transformation, select this, disconnect from the repository, reconnect to the other repository, and then paste it in. After you do that two times, you realize, I'm going to have one repository. So company policy is, even though there might be hundreds of transformations in there, we only have one repository. That way I can look at what other people have done, reuse components, and, and get going really quickly. Okay, so second tip, I think this is one of the more important tips here, is you want to automate everything. So data migrations are really complex things because there's things that are moving left and right, and if you don't script them, <clears throat> you end up in a world of pain where you have two inconsistent systems. Um, you, you think you've gone through all the processes, but at the end of the day, you left one out, and then now you generate an error or contacts are missing. It becomes really complicated uh, to keep track of it. So what are some of the things that you need to do and automate? Well, you have a legacy system that's probably still live and hot, right? People are writing data to it. Well, you don't really want to interact with that system directly. What you want to do, have the client do is maybe do a daily dump or eight-hour dump every eight hours. Put that also into Dropbox, right? So now you have a, you have a, they don't have to upload anything. They just save it locally and you create a, if it's a Windows system, you create a .bat file that dumps the database. It ends up in the folder that you want it to. It gets synchronized, and I get a copy of it. They don't have to do anything. So then they can put it on a window schedule. Boom, I have it, right? Or if it's a Linux box, it's even easier. They create a cron job. It does a MySQL dump. Also places it into Dropbox, and then I have it available everywhere. Um, I need to do things like create an environment where I'm going to push the data into, right? When my team is doing development on features, I don't necessarily want to push data into their environment because they might have their own test data that they set up, and I don't want to wipe it clean and add the data from the legacy database. So I want to have a separate system where I'm taking all the configuration and modules that they've developed, clone it, and just use that as a receptacle, clear out all the context, like what you were suggesting or asking for how to do, clear out all the context that I don't want, and then just push all the data from the legacy system into that. <coughs> so before I do any operation, I need some sort of reset mechanism where I go back to the clean database, because I might iterate over this multiple times. Um, the act of cloning this development server that everybody's working on to a target instance, that needs to be scripted. Um, I would like to know if all the database connections are working, because a lot of times you have multiple sources of data and you just need to ensure that P Pintao data integration can read from all the sources because if the connection fails, the whole transformation will fail, right? So it's good to like do a sanity check and say, uh, is the MySQL server up? Is the SQL server up? Is the Oracle database up? And then start doing the work because there might be other steps that take a long time and an hour later you find out, oh, the SQL server was <coughs> never responding because it crashed, right? And then you lost an hour, so you don't want to do that. Um, you want to keep the intermediary file, so we talked about the CSV import that takes it from the command line. If you generate files that are used to import stuff, you want to keep all those files in some sort of directory. Well, if you're using Dropbox for synchronization anyways, might as well put them in Dropbox, and then each client has their own little Dropbox folder with, where the CSV files that get generated from the data from the legacy system, get dumped into, and then they're being used to call the import. Keep that there. You, you, at the same time, when, you, when the import finishes, you have a database snapshot, right? The import is finished. Now I have a system with all the data in it. You want to keep that somewhere. Keep it in the same folder. And then uh, Pentao spits out quite a bit of uh, logging data. You want to keep, keep track of that as well somewhere, like save it to a file or have, have Pent. PDI kind of output it to that directory. So this is just a diagram of what a job might look like. So the green um, sort of pieces there are all transformations that get called. And then uh, I have a start um, step here. So everything emanates from the start step. The start step is the first step, so it has to unconditionally move here. So that's what this lock means, basically. If, if the start happens, the next step just has to happen. because. It's a start step. <coughs> but then I'm checking for the database connection. 
So this step basically runs through all the databases that I need to be talking to for the ETL to happen, because ETL just means I'm going to extract data from all kinds of sources and then mash them up and spit them out into another database. So I want to make sure my source databases are all live and my target database is live, right? So it's just checking whether I can talk to them using the credentials that I've provided. <coughs> if this fails, what, this is what the green error means on the connection. If the upstream value fails, then it will just stop the whole transformation and refuse to do the rest, right? But you can set it to be unconditional. So even if it fails, continue. <coughs> Generally, for large migration jobs, it's not a good idea to do that. So you always want it to unconditionally fail if the previous step failed downstream. I'm creating some directories that I need in order to store some CSV files that need to be FTP'd or SFTP'd up. So I need to make sure that those directories exist beforehand. So I do all of that in the transformation. Maybe I move the target server. Those directories don't exist anymore. I run the thing and then all of a sudden, oh, it fails because I can't save the files. Well, make sure everything is contained within the transformation, uh, the job. Then it's doing this operation that we talked about, which is resetting the database. It could be clearing out contacts, or it could be you know, cloning it, whatever it might be. It does that, and then it starts doing a big transformation here that creates entities. So these steps below are the major transformation steps. So here I'm creating the individuals, I'm pulling the organizations out, I may be pre-massaging all the address fields, making sure that they're there, and I'm creating a whole bunch of intermediary CSV files. Then I delete a zip file that is kind of the payload. I zip up these CSV files that have a certain naming convention. I SFTP these files to the server, and then on the remote server, I unpack them again. Why? Because CSV files can get large. I mean, you could have 10 megabyte files, and if you SCP 10 megabyte files up, it takes a while. If you zip them up, they'll be 100K, boom, you know, it takes much less time. So this chunk of the transformation is always sort of the, uh, you know, tr transmit the payload. And this does the same thing, transmit the payload, transmit the payload, right? And then <clears throat> once I've created the entities, I have, say, an ownership organization. So, so VCRM expects there to be one organization that owns all the data. So you create that, for instance. You create some membership types that are essential. Um, then you create the individuals and import the organizations and the households if you have those, right? So all the major entities are now in the system. What's missing is phone numbers, uh, spousal relationships, relationships of any sort, phone numbers, all these other things that dangle off of the main entities, right? <clears throat> but if I don't have a John Smith there, then I can't attach a John Smith address to it. Makes sense, right? So in the second one, what I'm doing is now that all these pieces are imported, on the second step, I'm looking at, OK, which pieces made it into Civic CRM? Give me, because I know the external identifier. My legacy system might be Razor's Edge or Donor Perfect or something. They have some sort of ID. I know which system, made, which part made it over, and I look it up. And I say, give me, give me the Civic CRM IDs that you created when you Im imported the Donor Perfect record with ID A, B, C, D, right? And then I do a lookup step, and I ask Civic CRM, what's the Civic CRM ID? Then it gives that back to me, and I use that to then tie the phone numbers to that, for instance, or the email. And I create just, I swap out the donor perfect ID with the Civi Serum ID because it needs that, and then at import time, it understands, oh, I have to add this phone number to that record, right? So that's what's happening in the second step. And the third step would be things like tertiary records, like relationships that ha require both the spouse and the husband to be in there, and then have to tie those together, or custom data fields that need to be added to donations that already made it in, you know, that type of stuff goes in here. And then, um, and then I do a whole bunch of importing. Now that I've the contact IDs for records that are already in, I import the relationships, phone, email, websites, address, contributions, event data, whatever might be there, and then at the end, <coughs> There's the success piece. Well, how long does this sort of transformation take? Well, in the good old days, before we used what we're using now, this might take like two days, right? For 500,000 records with two million um, donations, it could take two days. Because each one of those is a database write. So imagine you have a VPS that doesn't have an SSD drive. 
that's a spinning platter that has to wait for the right sector to come around and then has to write this little bit of information each time that you're trying to write one row of database record. There's some caching that makes it a little easier and faster, but I mean, it, it could take a day, for instance. So that's a long time to wait for you to realize that something went wrong in the ETL and then fix it because now your cycle is a day. <laughs> and um, if you don't find the bug, then it's two days. <laughs> If you don't find a bug, it's four days, three days. I mean, it just keeps going. So um, we found some really clever ways of getting around this sort of long time uh, wait, and I'll, I'll go into those. OK, so you have the excellent question, where do I install this, right? It runs everywhere. Do I install it on my phone? No, don't install it on your phone. Install it on the server that you have access to that's in the cloud um, so that you can run long running processes there. Um, you can install Dropbox there and on your local machine. Keeps the repository in sync, so you don't have to worry about you know the server running an outdated version of what you're running locally. Um, a lot of source systems are proprietary. Uh, 10, 15 years ago, Microsoft was the only plain town. So, like Razor's Edge, for instance, uses at its core a SQL Server engine that's kind of deeply embedded there. It's crypt crippled enough that you can't make any queries to it, but it's smart enough to execute the stored routines and, and stored procedures that Razor's Edge needs, right? So it's kind of embedded. You can dump the, uh, the database as a .bak file and then upload it into any SQL server, and now you've kind of like made it queryable and you can, you can run your standard SQL queries to it. Well, then you need a SQL server to 2016, right? <clears throat> Well, are you going to run it on your laptop while the cloud is accessing your laptop? Not a good idea, right? So in order for you to have everything in one location, just create a KVM, virtualize the Windows on, your, on another server, install SQL Server 16, 2016. Actually, the developer edition recently was made freely available. About a year and a half ago, you had to still pay $60 to get the developer license. Since this is not a production system, while you're doing the migration, you're not, customers are not coming and entering data into your web application. It's not even a web application. It's just like a dead database that you pulled from Razor's Edge and put online for you to do queries to. It's not production. So um, the developer edition now is freely available, so you can download it. It's like three gigabytes. You can install it. You get all the nice tools. SQL Studio management, this and that, and um, <clears throat> you can go ahead and, and query all of it. I would say probably 80 to 90 percent of all projects that we get have some sort of SQL Server component. So this this will come in handy for you guys. Um, I'm not so sure how Windows 10 virtualizes in KVM, but we've had great experience with Windows 8.1, and you can still buy licenses for Windows 8.1 on Amazon and. Then you have a disk, and you can install it wherever you want. Um, so, but now you have like a SQL server running in the cloud, and you have this PDI server running in the cloud. And you know, as you've seen, PDI, Pentao is very visual. So if there's a bug that you're running into, how do you dig, diagnose it, right? Well, that's where uh, X2Ghost comes, comes into play. So there was this really awesome uh, Italian open source company called NX Server that did great work, but then they didn't make any money um, open sourcing their stuff, so they become more and more closed source. But their project, because it was still open source, was forked. One of the beauties of open source, if somebody abandons it, the code is still there, so you can do whatever you want with it. And these guys, I think they're based in Germany, um, created X2Go. It's a very, very fast way of accessing a remote server and basically seeing what you would see if you're logged in in front of the console. And then if you install LXDE, which is a lightweight X window system, because you need some sort of windowing system to have these GUI elements show up, um, with those two pieces, <clears throat> you can basically run Pentao remotely uh, from a coffee shop on your Amazon cloud infrastructure or Linode or whatever it might be. <coughs> Any questions related to that? I unfortunately can't help you installing SQL Server 2016 or Windows 8.1 in KVM. It's not that difficult, but it's a pain because as soon as you install Windows 8.1, it will want to do uh, 38 reboots and 15 updates of all of these cumulative patches that it needs. And you're going to be sitting there pretty much eight hours babysitting the system. Um, but um, once you've done it, 
the works. You'd only need that if you were um, importing from a Windows-based system. Yeah. Um, so, so you're asking if I have a live system that's Windows and it allows me to do an ODBC or JDBC connection to it directly. So, I mean, if you got your data in some other format. Okay. In an existing system that's not based on Windows, you wouldn't need that tool. Uh, I don't need Windows. Yeah, then I don't need Windows. But you need some sort of database. And, and <clears throat> the issue that I have with these proprietary vendors is that if they... They, they go by instance, right? So the organization has one instance running on a server. If they now want to make, I don't, you don't really want to query the live server, in my opinion, because that can have all kinds of uh, performance impact on the, on the server, depending on how much volume is going through. So I would always recommend having a secondary system that they can clone, but then sometimes the vendor goes, well, it's two systems. We're going to smack you with double the license fee. That can happen as well, so just be careful. Uh, and sometimes it's so tightly embedded that you can't run this database engine itself and you don't even know what it is. You just access it from the outside and then it becomes really hard. All right, <clears throat> so here to add to the tool soup, there's another tool that you can add on top of Pentaho. It's called Jenkins and it's a, it's a really awesome, also Java-based application that can trigger jobs. So it's generally used as a scheduler um, in the context of continuous integration, I don't know if you guys are familiar with that word. In continuous integration or continuous delivery, you might have a code change upstream in a Git repo. Some programmer made a change. That change triggers a whole rebuild of the system with tests that need to be triggered, and then at the end you get a result. Well, that just caused some sort of regression or issue. So it's sort of taking any change in your source code and just making sure that the entire application itself is sound after that change has been made. So it's just kind of really tight quality controls that are built in. So Jenkins is mostly used for those types of jobs, but you can use it for pretty much anything. Uh, we use it to synchronize two databases across systems because it has really nice ways of SSHing into different servers, pulling stuff out, archiving it as well, and then sending us an alert on Slack, for instance. Hey, if synchronization was successful, it took two minutes. Um, so it's very extensible. Uh, it can do conditional triggering, so like it tries to do one job, it fails, then it tries to do another job to rescue it, and then if that fails, it can do something else. Or if that succeeds, it does another downward cascade, so you can do a whole kind of decision tree of things. Um, probably not important for migrations, but you know, it's one of the features. Um, it can, has, has great alerting, and what we love about this is this feature here. <clears throat> it has a really nice web user interface, so people can actually log on to Jenkins. Why is that important? Well, we have some clients that want to trigger a job, but we don't ever want to give them SSH access to our server. <laughs> so it, they wouldn't know what to do on the command line, but they know how to log on, and if we give them that one job and a push button, this is how you kick off the ETL, then if they do some data cleaning on their source system and they feel like, hey, it's done, can you guys please run it? They don't have to come running to us. They know, oh, we can go to the website, hit a button, and that starts the whole migration process. And then they can see the data and they actually get notified, hey, the migration is completed successfully, go back to this website and do it. So it adds sort of a screen filter with really fine great permissions where we can have people do that kind of thing. Um, it has a REST API, so you can call it, and like I could trigger a job on my phone if I wanted to, just sending a REST API call. Uh, it has great logging, and it saves all the artifacts, and shows you how long each job took to run, and you can kind of benchmark things, and it's great. This is just a screenshot of Jenkins. Um, you might have jobs here. This is sort of the status review. You know, when it was last successfully run, this is the start button. Um, and then you can have multiple queues, so it can kind of, you can say this job can only run once, and if you try to trigger it the second time, it refuse to run it, for instance, right? Sometimes if you're doing a big job and things are being overwritten, you want to block it, and you can do that. Or you can run it in parallel if you if you like to, that can do it both. <coughs> Orchestration, I'm gonna skip over a couple things because I think I'm running out of time. Um, Fabric is a great tool, it's an orchestration tool like Capistrano, or uh, I think Mode M is the one that uh, is being used by um, what are, what, what's the well it, it's basically a way of accessing a server remotely and telling it what to do in a scripted way using Python. Uh, the reason why we like it is we can do something like this. We can create a task and that says 
<coughs> define a task as a run full client import, then do a check, which is a function, and it goes in and checks whether it's the RAM based. It does a clone, it does an import, and then it pushes the import for a review to a staging server and then sends us a notification on Slack. So it sort of gives us a recipe of what's being done. Each step is well defined, and, and, then, and then we just run Fabric, run this task, and then it goes to the server and knows what to do. Very, very handy. And then you can time this on the command line, and then you know how long it took for the whole thing to take, to take place. Uh, this is an aspect of Pentaho that's really not used very much. It's kind of a hidden feature, so I want to point this out to you. That's really, really cool. Um, imagine you have a transformation, and you have this sort of chain uh, pipelining. And, and while you're looking at Pentaho, while it's doing the transform, you can actually hover over each of the steps, and it tells you how many rows per second it's processed. Imagine all of the other steps processed at 100 rows per second, but there's that one step that is really time intensive. Maybe it's talking to the network, to some other server. It only gets like five rows per second. Well, that's your rate limiting step, right? Because that is the chokehold that's holding up the whole pipeline. Well, if you know that that's this step here, for instance, <clears throat> you can go one step above and say, hey, instead of sending data to one and other steps sort of distribute it, send it round robin. Basically send the first one to this guy, second one to this guy, third guy, and just distribute it outward like this, right? Like to what you would do at a, a mail clerk would do, right? If you have like five desks and people are working, right? It would just distribute the workload. Well, down below, you just spin up as many copies of that step that's rate limiting that you need because it's, mul it's multi-threaded, it's Java. It just spins up another thread. You have now 10 copies working. The above step is round robining the data to however many pieces are watching for it. Now you have a tenfold improvement on that one step without doing any programming. And this, in programming parlance, is really hard to do correctly without messing up the downstream data. So it's built in, two clicks away, and you're done. Um, random subset. <clears throat> So when you do large imports of like 500,000 individuals, you don't really need to import 500,000 individuals. So I really recommend taking a subset. And in Pentaho, there's, um, um, there's a way of sort of doing that using one step. You just say how many samples, what the sample size is. Uh, what's nice is uh, processing data, connecting to all the data sources, and manipulating it and kind of prepping it is very, very fast. What's really slow is trying to insert every one of the rows into the database. There you have to wait for the disk to be ready and you know, it writes one thing after the other. So um, there's an awesome step here under the statistics folder called reservoir sampling. You just plug it in downstream from a database table. This could be like the main entity that you're looking at, which is an individual or organizations. You say, I only want 5,000. And then it will randomly sample which is great because you get a good cross-section of data each time it's slightly different. You might hit an edge case more likely. If you don't do random sampling, you'll always get the first 5,000 or so, and then you won't see what happens with this 555th you know, record. <coughs> uh, use port forwarding on SSH connections. Um, this is really important. You don't really need to take notes. I'm gonna make this publicly available afterwards. The idea is that um, you have all these database connections that need to be connected, but um, you might want to use a different database server on your local development environment. Well, you can change all the pieces in the ETL, but it's much better to do forwarding because you can change what this port would be called and what the target is. It might be a local development machine that's a different name. So this is the command that you issue to the port forwarding. All it means is that all of your database queries are encrypted because they go through SSH rather than over TCP IP. <coughs> If you don't have this, you need something else like SSL and TLS to do that. Um, here's the thing that saved us loads of pain. Um, what we are doing in, nowadays is actually doing imports into a memory-based database. So databases have files where they store the structure of the database. And uh, under my, for MySQL, all the files are under var libmysql. And all the tables and database files are stored there. Well, if you take all of those files and put them into RAM, you basically all of a sudden made your database server about 50 times faster, both for reads and writes, especially for writes. But if your server craps out and goes down, you lose your data. Well, I don't care because it's a migration system. It's not, 
It's not their life system. So if the system goes down, I reboot it, and then I start the migration again. But the migration itself is 20 times faster, right? I don't have to wait two days. I wait four hours, and then I, can't, I, have, I have it back. So the ephemeral nature of just putting everything to RAM, I don't really care about. Because at the end of the day, when I've done Im importing everything, I can dump it to the SQL file. I have an actual file on the disk. I don't care what happens to the database. If I had an online system that had a lot of transactions, I would be more worried. <clears throat> so this is just a script that lets you do that with MySQL. It changes a few things and reboots things. And then here you get some speed improvements because the green is the RAM disk and this is the SSD. And if you had platter disk, that would be like, you wouldn't even, you know, it's even, even slower than this. Um, create a web service architecture. That means in Pentaho, if you have something to do, give it to a REST endpoint, create that endpoint, and then from there you get something parsed back or cleaned, and then you can ingest it. This is really cool because once you use it for cleaning, you can also then go back to CiviCRM and write an extension that might use that for online, online data submissions and clean things on the fly. So here you might have this um, chain of events. Here's a REST client that calls the Tornado API. Tornado is just a Python web service. You can write an API server in 20 lines of code. Um, <clears throat> one way of doing it. Later on, you can reuse it. Quick, uh, got two more things. Uh, virtualize all of your servers, and then you can have everything running in uh, contain, basically in in in, uh, in VPSs within one large server that you'd rent out. <coughs> and this gives you sort of an idea what a full pipeline would look like. You have something like Razor's Edge. You dump it nightly, the client puts it into Dropbox, you load it up in your staging server that you can actually query. Pentao starts migrating the data into uh, CBCRM that's RAM-based, so this goes really fast. And then in the meanwhile, it's also doing some lookup, maybe cleaning the uh, addresses, trying to do some deduping. And then the client also provides some data that's remapping sort of fields, options, relationship names, and so forth, and subsuming them. You can ingest all of the Google Sheets directly in Pentaho and then remap them on the fly and you have your finished DTL. If you want to do something more complex, um, like merging, this is a nightmare. Uh, trust me, don't try to do this. This is the reason why when you have a legacy system and a new system, don't launch the new system unless you've got everything all ducks in a row. Uh, this is a really, really complicated process. Um, we're dealing with one of these for one of our clients. It's really messy. Um, uh, but you can also use a similar pipeline for live deduping. You have a production CiviCRM system. Um, you pre-process some of this data. You add it to a dedupe database. You run the Python process. And then you uh, run the ETL to merge the duplicates that you identified. And, and this process is really awesome. It's uh, very fast. You can deduplicate 50,000 records in 20 seconds and then apply the results back in. That's the end of the presentation. Any questions? We don't have any time for questions. <laughs> okay, go ahead. What's the pricing model for Pentaho? What does it cost? Uh, so we have been using it for seven years and we have not paid a dime or pen, penny <laughs> or pence. Um, the reasoning is uh, they're, they're open source in the true way, which means there's a community version that you can just download and use. It's a little bit behind the others in terms yeah, of connectors. Yeah. But it, it works perfectly fine. It's not a crippled crippleware, which is what happens a lot of times. Mm -hmm. Does it yeah. compare well to Talib? Um, I prefer Pentaho, and I've done a side-by-side -side comparison early on. Pentaho gives you a lot more inspectability into each step. There's fewer clicks um, in order to get the same thing done. It, the interface doesn't fight you. I think in Talon, it's, there's a couple options that are uh, buried. Um, this has been around about as long as Talent, um, but I, I would hedge a bet that they're going to be around longer than Talent, <laughs> and that's more important to me. I just want to think, is, is, there any, is there any issue about loading data on Dropbox? Loads of personal so Dropbox has, uh, has a couple of certifications. Um, you just have to be careful that you don't share a link to Dropbox, because that's public all of a sudden. So um, they are HIPAA compliant, FERPA compliant. And um, yeah, great. Any other questions? Beer time. Thank you very much.